Okay, so as I mentioned, we're picking up in chapter five where we left off last time, which is verse seven. Uh, and I'm just gonna jump straight in. So in verse seven, James writes, therefore brothers, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. Okay, so after providing three instances uh, in our, our last uh, study, after providing three instances of selfish motives, James now turns back to the implications of submission to God. What does that mean? Um, and so, you know, as James says there at the beginning of verse seven, therefore, so everything that's, that was before this has led up to this moment. And so since the Lord of hosts, remember he mentioned that in verse four, since the Lord of hosts hears his people and will one day judge all mankind according to their deeds, so then be patient until the Lord's coming. Now, the word that's, that uh, many translations have there for coming is, is a word that basically means to be near, okay? So, until the Lord is near. Now, of course, there's a sense in which the Lord is always near. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But I want to deal first with the patience aspect, all right? So, the word patience there is the word macrothumeo. Macro meaning long and thumeo meaning temper, so long temper, or as some other, um, you know, as we might see it in some other instances, long suffering, suffering long. And so this would really be the opposite of one who is quick tempered, one who lets their temperature, uh, temperature, temper get out of control. Um, you know, we, we see that elders, wow. Uh, in Titus 1 7, elders are to be men who are not quick tempered. They're to be men who are long suffering. Um, so, you know, basically what James seems to be saying is it's going to take patience to endure future events until the Lord's return. Now, we've already seen some instances here where it may have been that the church is suffering at the hands of those who are living for self in selfish means. You know, just at the beginning of chapter five here, we saw people that are withholding pay and they are greedy. And so people are suffering as a result of that because they don't have what they need to live. Um, and so it's, it's going to take patience on the part of the victim then to endure until the Lord returns or at least until the Lord acts. Um, you know, if you're the oppressed in that scenario or some, some similar wrongdoing, um, patience in the face of injustice that, that directly affects you is difficult. I think that kind of goes without saying. But, you know, James says then, though, that, that waiting on the Lord's action, um, you know, we see in some other places, I think, for instance, 1 Peter 2.12, we see the term used a day of visitation. Um, now, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Lord is literally coming to visit. It can mean, though, a day that the Lord is going to act. Uh, so it can be uh, an act of judgment or the final judgment. Um, I, I'm not going to get into whether I think that James is talking about some future earthly event or, you know, the actual end of time. Um, but, but basically what James is saying, though, is that waiting on the Lord's action, either presently or at the final judgment, it may take some time for that to, to be carried out. I think, for instance, of Habakkuk, who was looking around and saying, Lord, why are you letting this injustice take place? And the Lord said, I'm working on something here that you're not going to believe, but you're just going to have to wait for it. And that's the conclusion that Habakkuk came to at the end of that book. I'm just going to wait on the Lord. No matter what happens, I'm going to wait on the Lord. So James then uses an example here of a farmer patiently waiting for things that he can't control. Um, you know, a farmer can do a lot of things to promote growth, but the actual growth of his produce is not something that he really has any hand in. The produce grows because God allows it to be so. Um, and so the farmer has to patiently wait for that produce to grow. He has to wait on the rain to sustain his crops. 
And so just as in, in the same way that a farmer would have to do that, the church also has to wait for either Jesus to act or his eventual return, whatever comes first. Now, James uses a term here, the early and the late rains. Now, again, if this is a Jewish audience, that should be kind of a trigger for them because this is an image that's particularly used at multiple times through the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 14, as God is uh, enumerating the blessings for obedience, one of the things he says is that he will provide the spring and fall rains so that their crops can be abundant. So it's, it's a blessing of obedience is what it is. Um, in Hosea 6, 3, we see it as a sign of a renewed relationship with the Lord. Uh, as the Lord is wooing his bride, that is Israel at that point, that, that renewed relationship between them is um, evidence of that is given by the fact that he will refresh. Um, and that's kind of more of a metaphor, metaphorical sense with that. But again, it ties back to those blessings in Deuteronomy 11. And then in Joel 2.23, um, again, Joel is all about a day of visitation. Um, and if Israel will repent, then these early and late rains will be a sign of restoration uh, and a sign of the Lord's faithfulness uh, in the face of their repentance. And so, you know, this should be ringing all kinds of alarm bells in, in a, a Jewish uh, audience's mind. Uh, but, you know, again, similar to the farmer, a, a farmer in Israel is living based on how their crops do. And, and the rain is a very big part of that, the rains that come in the spring and the rains that come in the fall. Um, but the thing is, though, is that a farmer doesn't, you know, and I'm not a farmer. I, I will attest to that out front. I'm a city boy. But what I do know is a farmer does not wait idly by. Um, he works to prep the soil and he works to sow the seed and he works to create conditions for that for those crops to grow. So, you know, again, it makes me think back to uh, Peter's words in 2 Peter 3.12, as we're waiting for the day of the Lord or waiting on, you know, God to answer prayer. Um, as Peter says in 2 Peter 3.12, as you wait for and earnestly desire the coming of the day of God, it is clear what manner of people you ought to be in hon hond holy conduct and godliness. Okay, so, so this isn't just patience, this is active patience. So James continues then, verses 8 and 9, you also, like the farmer, you also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts, because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Okay, so, so James now telling them uh, then, Two main things while you're waiting, just as the farmer doesn't sit idly by, and just as you are supposed to be a people of holy conduct and godliness, here's some things that you can actively be doing. First of all, strengthen your hearts. Okay, so strengthen your hearts, and I think the indication there is strengthen them based on the hope of the Lord being near. We should constantly be reminding ourselves and be in scripture to be reminded, as Jesus said, I am coming soon. Uh, I, my time is always imminent. And so you should live in that way. So strengthen your hearts. Again, nearness of God implies both his constant presence. The Lord, in, in a sense, is always near. He is always near his people to hear our prayers, uh, to act on our behalf, uh, and to be attentive to our needs and our worship. But there's always also the sense that we've been talking about in which his imminent return is always near. And so, you know, this, it's this, this constant process of training our heart and strengthening it. And, and the way that we're going to do that is through wisdom and perspective, as we've already talked about, you know, I, I, primarily in chapter one, but, but all through the book. The wisdom and the perspective are going to accomplish that strengthening. You know, 
and thinking about the types of trials that we might endure, whether it may be trying to withstand some enemy uh, or, you know, fight back against some sort of verbal uh, argument or, you know, accosting or something like that. We can build up the physical body all we want to, uh, but, but really building up the physical body, working out and doing all those things, that's, that's not what's going to get us through trials. What's going to get us through trials is the heart. The body may give out at any time for any reason, but the heart can overcome if it's set on godliness. And I think that's really one of the points of emphasis in Ecclesiastes. You can give the body all the things that it wants. You can make the body as happy as it wants to be and please it all you want to. But what we're to be concentrating on is the heart. And so pleasing God and strengthening our hearts in his wisdom is what's ultimately going to be beneficial. So that's number one, strengthen your hearts while you wait. The second thing you can do while you wait then is avoid complaining and groaning about one another. And I think particularly, you know, he's talking about begrudging your brethren. Now, you know, we, we can talk about how we shouldn't be complaining about people, and we, we covered that a little bit last week. But this in particular, you know, a heart set on godliness doesn't view other brethren as the source of our miseries or compare our hardships to their good fortune. We may look at people that we go to church with or we associate with that are also members, and they're not going through the same types of things that we are, and we may resent that fact. But James tells us, avoid complaining about that and groaning about that. You have a job to do. Now, now they should be strengthening you. We're going to get to a one another uh, passage here towards the end of the book. But, you know, don't, don't complain because you see others that may be doing well or, you know, you see others that, that you know, are experiencing some sort of misfortune or something like that. Um, you, you have things to worry about. Uh, Barnes writes this in, in his commentary. He says, there's some persons who are always grumbling. You know, do we know people like that, that are, that just always seem to be grumbling about something? There are some persons who are always grumbling. They have a sour, dissatisfied, discontented temper. They see no excellence in other persons. They are displeased that others are more prospered, honored, and beloved than they are themselves. They are always complaining of what others do, not because they are injured, but because others seem to them to be weak and foolish. They seem to feel that it becomes them to complain if everything is not done precisely as in their estimation it should be. It is needless to say that this spirit, which Barnes said, this spirit, the offspring of pride, we talked about that before, will make any man lead a wretched life and equally needs to say that it is wholly contrary to the spirit of the gospel. We are not a people who complain about things. It doesn't mean that we don't address injustice. It doesn't mean that we don't try to right wrongs. It does mean that we don't devolve into just bitter complaint about every little thing that we see is wrong. We are to be a solution on this planet. We're not to simply point out all the things that are wrong with it. Okay, so, so we've got a twofold, twofold job there. And so, you know, one of the last things he says there is that the judge is near. It's not just other people that are listening to our complaints. It's not just our close companions who are listening to our complaints and our kind of bitter griping. The Lord is hearing those as well. And, you know, he's always near. So this, this completely relates back to us controlling our tongue, controlling how we interact, what we say, and all of those types of things, because the judge is always near, and we always need to be looking forward to his return. Let me pause here and uh, ask for any commentary or questions or anything to this point. You know, uh, Adam, it is written to Jewish people, and they were going through a terrible situation, especially those under the shadow of the temple. 
uh, especially those around Judea and Judea. And so we, we know the Lord is coming. And uh, it, it, in our own time, it could happen. But there was also a coming of the Lord against Jerusalem. And I wonder if he isn't also talking about that here, that he's near in that uh, in just really not too many years, uh, at the most a couple of decades, he's going to come and he's going to all those unbelieving Jews that are persecuting, ridiculing, uh, not paying their employees their employees and so on um, if if he's talking about that just these unbelieving Jews taking advantage of the believing Jews through the court system in whatever way they possibly can um, I can I can see that he may also be talking about that here and and that would be a great incentive also you know to continue on because they knew that that was going to be happening they didn't know when but they knew it was coming up pretty soon here that that time was rapidly approaching right very good comment and that's that's why i tried to make the emphasis there that you know when it's spoken of as a day of visitation in other parts of scripture or just the lord being near or imminent in this particular yep. it could be a time of judgment but not necessarily the final judgment so thank yes. you for clarifying yeah. that any other comments on that that particular section. Okay, well, let's, let's continue along. Speaking of those who are persecuted, James now covers the prophets. He brings them in as an example. Verses 10 and 11 now. Brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome from the Lord. The Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So James illustrates the need for patience then by pointing back to the prophets. Now we might think uh, of the prophets as men like Joseph and Moses and Jeremiah. If you think of those particular individuals, though, often they were persecuted by their own people, nonetheless. But, but, you know, thinking about those men and their character, men like Joseph and Moses and Jeremiah and many others, they're ones that we consider blessed, not because they never suffered, but because they did, and because the testing of their faith produced endurance, doing its complete work in them so that they were complete, lacking nothing to kind of bring in chapter one into this conversation. So, you know, you think about this kind of blessedness, this, this blessed state uh, or a state of approval, because as we've said before, that's what blessing is. It, it's an approval by God. Um, so, you know, you think about that, first of all, in light of the Beatitudes, so many connections in James to uh, the Sermon on the Mount and the things that Jesus has to say there. Uh, but in Matthew 5, 1 through 8, when we see the, the Beatitudes and the type of people that are blessed, they're, they're not people who are necessarily going through great things. It's, it's the humble. It's the persecuted. It's the poor in spirit. Those types of people are the ones that are considered blessed. And so, you know, in thinking about the prophets, their work of faith in the face of that suffering, that's what approved them before God because they were steadfast and continued in that work, not becoming discouraged to the point that they gave up. Certainly we see, you know, these men become discouraged and, and, and we would probably give up long before they did. Uh, I don't know how Moses did it, <laughs> to be honest, other than by the grace of God. But, you know, we read about these, t uh, these types of people in Hebrews 10 and 11. And I, I won't steal too much of Eddie's thunder from next time or, or from uh, the next uh, class. But, you know, what the Hebrew writer has to say about these people is that all of them, all of these people that endured uh, through their faith were the ones that were approved because they were enduring the dangers they could see by looking forward to a promised rest that they could not yet see. So, so very you know, apt uh, uh, example that James gives here. Uh, 
of, uh, of uh, you know, folks that are enduring in the face of suffering. Um, then he, he brings up probably one of the most prominent uh, individuals and uh, that's an example of suffering that we read about in scripture, and that is Job. Um, you know, Job is considered a righteous man by God at the beginning of the book. Uh, and at the end of the book, when we see that he's come through his situation, then God also considers him a righteous man, and he's remembered as such. Um, but, you know, his story is kind of particular poignant when we're thinking about suffering, not just in what he had to go through, but in the way that he faced it. Job is a very real and raw book. We see a man at his absolute lowest point. Um, suffering as much as a man can. And, you know, he has to process his grief in the face of his faith. And, you know, we, we see kind of the struggle that he goes through. First of all, internally, his own thought process of what he's going through. And then kind of the added pressure of his friends speculating on what he might have done to deserve this and you know, is there something he needs to do to make it right? And, and all of those types of things, uh, you know, processing all of that, I, I think is, is for our benefit that we can see how he goes through that and understand, just as we see many times in the Psalms, you know, we're, although James tells us to consider it all joy to go through trials, we're not always going to feel happy going through trials. And, and we've got to process that. And, and God knows that that's what we're having to do. And he understands that. Um, you know, so, so Job struggles, Job questions, and he even seems at some points to resent what he's going through. But one thing that never changes throughout the book is his faith in God. You know, he may question at some points he, he wants an answer to why God let this happen or why God may be doing this to him, but his faith in God is not diminished at all. Um, you know, I, I know my redeemer and that he lives and, and is ever there for me, Job says. Um, and so, you know, Barclay writes in his commentary, the word that's used here of Job, uh, yours might say patience or endurance is hupomoni. Uh, which describes not a passive patience, but that gallant spirit which can confront the tides of doubt and sorrow and disaster, disaster and come out with faith still stronger on the other side. There may be a faith which never complained or questioned, but still greater is the faith which was tortured by questions and still believed. Okay, so, you know, we might look at Job and, and we might think, well, you know, he's complaining. But if we're going through the same types of things that Job is going through, Job is processing. But his faith is stronger on the other side. And he's rewarded for that faith, both in the physical sense and in the approval sense. Um, so, you know, for us, it, it can be difficult to maintain faith sometimes in the face of suffering, things that we're going through. But if we ask for the type of wisdom and perspective that's mentioned in chapter 1, verse 5, for instance, we can endure, just as Job did, just as the prophets did, through the knowledge that God's power is made perfect in weakness, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. You know, and, and so James kind of finishes up his thought right here with God is very compassionate and merciful. And I think that's a call back to Exodus 34, when God is revealing himself to Israel, he says he is a compassionate and long-suffering God. So God is very compassionate and merciful in providing then what is needed to endure, which is wisdom, and in allowing us then to see what lies on the other side of our trust in him. Okay, so again, let me pause here. Any comments or questions on that particular thought? Okay, so let's continue then verse 12. Verse 12, now above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. Your yes must be yes and your no must be no so that you won't fall under judgment. 
Now, we might think here that, you know, James is kind of jumping between topics here, trying to get in whatever he can at the end of the, the letter. You know, it may be that this is related to what has come before. Uh, for instance, you know, oaths and swearing, uh, as in, you know, I, I'm going to do this thing in the name of the Lord, or I, uh, you know, I, uh, I say this thing in the Lord's name, and uh, all these types of things. Uh, possibly prompted by those thoughts of judgment. You know, if I, if I prove my loyalty to God by constantly invoking his name in everything I say and promise and all those types of things, maybe then I'll prove my worth to that judge and prove my worth to other people because they can see my piety. Uh, but, you know, as, as, as James writes and as, as what I think he's doing is quoting Jesus here from his words in the Sermon on the Mount, um, you know, there, there's no need to prove our loyalty or demonstrate piety by excessive oath taking. Um, your godly character is your expression of faith. And I think James has already talked about that, um, particularly in uh, chapter two, uh, verse 14 through 18. I will show you my faith by my works. I don't need you to constantly proclaim, um, you know, you're doing this and that in the Lord's name. Not that that inherently is a bad thing, but if you're doing that to show people how righteous you are, that's a problem. And I think that's what Jesus and James are addressing. Um, so, you know, this is almost word for word with Matthew 5, 33 through 37. Uh, but, you know, again, this, this is nothing new to a reader of the Old Testament. Leviticus 19, 12, Numbers 30, verse 2, Deuteronomy 23, 21 through 23, Basically, anything you say is said before the Lord because he is always near. If you're going to say it, you better mean it and you better back it up, uh, basically is what, what James is saying. Um, and so, you know, uh, this is kind of an improper way to invoke the Lord's name. What is a proper way to invoke the Lord's name, though, is in prayer. And that's predominantly what the rest of the chapter has to deal with. So let's continue on in verse 13 there. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church, and they should pray over him after anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will restore him to health. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Let's stop right there for just a minute, verse 15. So, you know, I said that this, this particular section is about prayer. You might have a subheading in your Bible from the, uh, uh, the publishers that says something like effective prayer or something to that effect. You know, prayer in this particular section, verses um, 13 through 18, prayer or praying is uh, used seven times. And, and I think as we've seen in our, our study of the Bible, if a word or concept is repeated multiple times throughout a given section, that's probably what the focus is about. So seven times in this section, prayer is used. Now we've got other activities that are mentioned, singing and anointing and those types of things. But Throughout the whole section, prayer is definitely the emphasis and the backbone of Christian activity. Um, so, you know, James began the book with it in chapter 1, verse 5, and he now concludes with it. So, presumably, prayer then is implied as a part of everything else that's mentioned in this book. All of our works, all of our words, all of our attitudes, all of our thoughts, all of them should have prayer involved in them. Uh, so, you know, I think that's, that's the point that, that James is trying to make. Now, you know, to, to look at this, um, uh, you know, prayer is not simply part of our activity, but also in every circumstance in which our activity is uh, occurring. So let's look at some of these activities. First of all, at the, the first part of verse 13, is anyone among you suffering, he should pray. Now, everything we've just talked about, I think, can attest to this particular fact. But really, you know, if you think about it, prayer is the opposite of grumbling. Instead of bemoaning our situation and our circumstances, we are taking those circumstances and bringing them before the Lord and presenting them to Him. 
And what a release that is, that we can bring those burdens to him and just lay them at his feet and say, you know, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. I don't know how I'm going to make it through. And I don't know what the other side looks like, but you do. And so I'm bringing that to you. Please help me through this and help me to glorify you as, as I'm going through it. So, you know, uh, Again, this is specifically related to the advice in one five, but our prayer really is for wisdom to endure the trial and, and come out the other side of it mature and complete and be an example of, of one who does that and glorifies God in the midst of it. The next thing he says then, uh, the latter half of verse 13, is anyone among you cheerful, he should sing praises. Uh, you know, now, now singing is definitely an integral part of our worship and, I, and our identity. And honestly, you could kind of, in some regards, think of singing as maybe musical prayer in some instances, right? Um, but uh, the thing about our, our prayers and our songs, inherent in both of those things, there is a recipient of both of those things, and there is a reason for both of those things. We have prayers of gladness. We have prayers of supplication. We have prayers uh, of praise, all of those types of things. And we have songs and singing for all of those things as well. Um, so, you know, if, if we're cheerful as Christians, we recognize where all good things originate. Chapter 1, verse 17, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. We then have a reason to be thankful for those things and a God to whom those thanks can be directed. That's unique to Christians, okay? Many in the world, if they have no God, they have no hope. They have no one to direct that supplication to. As Christians, we know that we can pray and sing and praise a God who exists and he acts on behalf of his people. Now, one thing to remember about this, this, the cheerful aspect of this, again, sometimes when we're going through things, it can be very hard to be cheerful or happy and, and those types of things. The word, the word cheerful here is um, euthumio, uh, which is also translated in other parts of the New Testament as courage. When Paul is on the ship in Acts chapter 27, and the storm is breaking apart the ship, and they're about to you know, be, be broken up on the sandbar and, and shipwrecked. One of the things that Paul says uh, to the people on the ship is, men, be of good courage. Or your translation might also say, be of good cheer. It's the exact same word that's used here in James. And, you know, Paul is saying that in the face of life-threatening circumstances in the middle of that storm. And the reason he can do that is because of the Lord's promises. Remember the thing that Paul says there, an angel has appeared to me and told me what is going to be the end result of this situation. Therefore, be of good cheer. Now, if you've read the book of Revelation and you've paid any attention to it, enduring through trial will lead to victory. If we keep that particular fact in mind, we can be cheerful through negative circumstances, or we can be of good cheer and good courage through negative circumstances if our perspective is properly oriented, as James says it should be. So now Paul goes to a, another situation here, and it's probably one of the more enigmatic of these three because of the things that James says. My purpose in going through this is to keep the focus on prayer because that's what I think James is doing. But Many questions have arisen based on this section. Uh, the sickness that Paul mentions, or I'm sorry, that James mentions, is it physical? Is it spiritual? Is it both? Uh, you know, what, what's the deal with that? Uh, if a person is physically ill, why would they call for elders instead of a physician to come and attend to them? And then, you know, what's the deal with this anointing of oil? Is this something we should be doing? Is, is this something that James is, is talking about? And, you know, explanations vary on all of these topics. I just want to cover some basic points because I know there may be questions about this, and I'm just going to be very upfront. I'm not going to be able to answer all of them, but, but I do, you know, want to bring out some points about this. So, first of all, there's two different words translated sickness here. 
Uh, and each of them is used at various times in the New Testament to designate instances of both physical and spiritual illness. Um, so in verse 14, the word sickness there uh, is asteneo, which means sickness or weakness. Uh, it typically refers to a physical weakness, but again, can also refer to a, a spiritual weakness as well. In verse 15, there's actually a different word, komno, um, which means weary or faint or distressed. So that really tends to go more towards the mental and spiritual state of someone. Um, but, you know, in the Old Testament, we certainly might remember that when the Jews were sick, they were instructed to go to the priest to be anointed with oil as a process, uh, a part of the process of purification. Uh, you know, particularly in the instance of things like skin diseases and, and things like that in Leviticus 14, they were to be anointed with oil as a part of that cleansing process. So oil has precedent. Um, in the New Testament, we see oil in Mark 6.13 as a part of the apostles' healing. Now, Mark 6.13 is the only gospel that mentions that as a part of the apostles' healing, but nonetheless, it's there. Um, and then Jesus actually mentions oil in the parable of the Good Samaritan, when the Samaritan tends to the man who's been beset by robbers, Oil is part of the medical treatment process that, you know, the first aid process that he gives that man in Luke 10. Uh, so, so it is very possible that oil is being used here as a medical or soothing agent. That's really kind of the point I'm trying to get to. Um, its use here, I, I think, doesn't necessarily imply a miraculous healing. Certainly in the time that James was writing this, that could be the case. Um, you know, it, it, it might be used uh, in as a uh, kind of a topical uh, ointment, like we would use neosporin or hydrocortisone or something like that. Um, but, you know, also it doesn't exclude the idea either that, that the oil has some sort of miraculous component to it. Uh, certainly if somebody asks, you know, uh, Dempsey or Eddie or somebody to come over to their house to visit them while they're sick, I don't think that they, you know, if they wanted to take some olive oil over there and anoint that person, I don't, I don't think they are overstepping is kind of where I'm going with that. Um, you know, we can explore all of these points in fine detail. I just wanted to bring them up because there may be questions about them. But really, you know, I, I think if, if that is our, our sole focus in this section, we have missed the point of James' advice. I don't believe that James is prescribing a kind of, you know, quote unquote, magic formula for healing. That's not the focus of this passage. Prayer is the point. It has been for the previous two. It, it still is. Um, in the situation outlined here, notice he says, call the elders. Well, what type of men are elders in the church, both at that time and today? Well, these are faithful men. They're men who are of proven faith. And they're men who are primary examples in the church of a working faith that, as we talked about with widows and orphans, who would visit people who are in distress. Remember we said that word visit is the same word um, presbyteros, which we use for elders. Um, and so these are the type of individuals who would do that thing. So it makes sense that somebody would, you know, first call for the elders to come and pray over them. Um, we're we're going to expand this in just a moment, but but to kind of further this point, you know, the, these are the type of people that you want in treating the Lord on your behalf because you know they are seeking the Lord's will. Remember back in chapter four, we said, what's the, what's the cause of fights and disturbances among you? Is it not people asking things for selfish ends. Well, the elders in the church, if they're of the type of character that elders should have, they are also of the type of character that aren't asking out of selfish motivation. They're doing it out of selfless motivation on behalf of the person who is ill. So it, it, it makes total sense that elders would be the first among people to ask for this. And then as James says, prayer will save or restore or make whole the, the one who is weary and faint and distressed, and the Lord will raise him up. So the emphasis here is on the Lord's activity. Um, and, and, and James continues then, if he has sinned, he will be forgiven. 
Now, now what's the link between disease and sin here? Are we saying that someone who has a disease is necessarily sinful? Well, you know, if we read the book of Job, we can say absolutely, you know, unequivocally, those things are not necessarily related. Um, but consider for a moment, many of Jesus' healings, when Jesus healed many times in the gospels, what almost always accompanied those healings. What did he almost always say to a person when he healed them? And it was something that, that usually God ended up getting in trouble. He would heal the person and then say, your sins are forgiven you, or go and sin no more. So, so there was a, a link there between what Jesus was doing, displaying his power and authority, and the forgiveness of sins. Um, so, so there may be some sort of link there. You know, John chapter 5, 1 through 18, the man that's crippled for 38 years, that, that's one of the things that happens there. But, you know, James saying then, the one who is prayed over is presumably one that is also seeking the Lord's will. And, and if he has sinned, and, and he is repentant of that sin, he will be forgiven. He will be forgiven, even if he doesn't recover from the illness, even if the answer to that particular part of the prayer is no, his sins can still be forgiven. And you can be sure that the Lord is answering that prayer in the affirmative. Um, I want to keep going just for the sake of time here. Verses 16 through 18, continuing the emphasis on prayer, then James writes, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The intense prayer of the righteous is very powerful. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, yet he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. So, you know, James' emphasis there is on faithful prayer. And now he, he brings in this one another aspect. Many lessons have been given on the one another passages in the Bible and our responsibilities to one another. Praying for one another is one of the primary things that the church is to be doing for its members. So James' emphasis on faithful prayer for one another then is applied to the whole church not just limited to the elders that he just mentioned in the previous example, because the intense prayer of the righteous is very powerful, and the righteous is whoever is considered righteous. So, you know, the power of prayer doesn't reside necessarily in the person who is praying, but in the God that's being prayed to. Um, you know, we looked last time at the significance of the, the cries of the oppressed, uh, particularly the righteous oppressed, uh, but the cries of the oppressed to the Lord of hosts. Um, and we mentioned last time that the Lord of hosts will always hear and always be attentive to those cries. Um, and he will act, whether in this life or in the next, he will act on their behalf. And so as creator and commander of the host of heaven, God is attentive to the prayers of his people, and he works on their behalf using the power at his disposal, which is a power that no man and no spiritual being can contest. And we should have a sense of confidence in that, and that it will work for those whom the Lord is attentive to. So, you know, through prayer then, we are asking the Lord then to direct his attention that's basically what we're doing in prayer. We're calling the Lord's attention to something, um, and we're, we're asking him to direct his power to that given situation. Um, and so then, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. The weapons that we use, the prayer that we, uh, that we um, employ, is the Lord's power at work in our lives. And as an example of this truth, then, James gives another example, Elijah. Uh, you know, we, he reminds the reader that the prophet Elijah was a man, a human, with a nature like ours. It, it, you know, there's nothing special about Elijah, the human being, uh, really. I mean, if we think about it in human terms, Elijah was actually kind of a lowly human being. 
uh, walking about in camel hair and living in the desert and things like that as John the Baptist did. However, Elijah, the righteous man, was a human who put his hope and trust in the Lord. So when he prayed according to the Lord's will and purpose, and I think that was the whole reason his prayer was effective. When he prayed according to the Lord's will and purpose, the creator then bent nature itself to his will so that the very rain from the sky was both withheld for a time and then was eventually continued on the same man's prayer. Um, and, you know, this really, if you think about it, could relate back to what we just talked about in chapter 5 and verse 7, the righteous man waiting like the farmer for the early and late rains. It, it would make a lot of sense why James is using Elijah then and Elijah's prayer for rain, among all things, as the example of a righteous man's prayer. So finishing out the book then uh, with the last two verses. Again, this might seem like an aberration from, you know, a, a different topic here at the end, but I think it's all related. Verses 19 and 20. My brothers, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his life from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now, there's a lot of pronouns in that particular passage, and not all of them are clear. The, the, the syntax of this sentence doesn't really make it entirely clear whose sins are considered covered by this act, uh, you know, whether it's the sinners or the teachers or, or any of those things. However, you know, I've, I've referenced Peter's writings multiple times throughout this study. Let's, let's look at a similar statement that Peter uses almost word for word and see if maybe it doesn't help to give us some meaning here in the larger context of what James has to say. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, it's one of the passages that Dempsey read this morning. Uh, both James and Peter are quoting from Proverbs 10, 12. Um, in Peter's context, the reminder is a part of a larger perspective that looks forward to the Lord's return. That's, that's kind of what we've been talking about here. But notice how many of the concepts that Peter mentions here are also covered in James' letter. Peter writes, now the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-headed and disciplined for prayer. Above all, keep your love for one another at full strength, since love covers a multitude of sins. There's that same quote there. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Based on the gift that each has received, everyone should use it to serve others as good managers of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks... His words should be like the oracles of God. If anyone serves, his service should be from the strength that God provides, so that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, because to him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. And so then the goal of our interaction, as James is talking about how we interact with one another as servants of the Lord, the goal of our interaction is love, and it's truth through which we will all grow into a stature measured by Christ, Ephesians 4.13. And so as stewards of God's gift of grace, we accomplish God's will by using his gifts to call men back to him in repentance, which then commends our souls because of the work we're doing, and it commends their souls because of the repentance that that work then will generate. Um, and so, you know, as the last reminder then in, in James's book, James kind of ends very abruptly with this statement to our eyes. But as the last reminder that James gives, it seems that everything that's been mentioned throughout the book has been leading up to this particular goal. You think about personal perseverance, you think about uh, growth, you think about good works, you think about self-control and selfless attitude. All of these should be directed toward the church's mutual goal of eternal salvation. And we speak on God's behalf, as Peter says, as the oracles of God, we speak on his behalf, imploring men to turn to him in repentance. And when we see with that perspective, and when we live with that perspective that James recommends throughout the book, that is the means by which we're all going to reach that goal of being saved eternally. 
So with those thoughts in mind, I want to come back around and look at the book as a whole. And, you know, just as a reminder, putting all of these things together, James may seem to us to be kind of a compilation of wisdom, like Proverbs, and some of these things might seem unrelated. But as we did in the very first class, look at the flow of James as you see the topics that he covers here. Chapter one, persevere through perspective. Endurance produces perspective and resolve, which should motivate each Christian to be a doer of the word. Then as a doer of the word in chapter two, we should practice what we preach. Being a doer of the word involves doing so impartially, without regard of station or earthly, you know, uh, earthly qualms, doing so impartially with pure motives to accomplish God's will. Faith must motivate that type of action. Now, as we're acting and as we're acting on the Lord's behalf in particular, we need to pipe down and listen up, as he's going to tell us in chapter three, because our words are important. What we say and how we say it are important in our work for the Lord. And so words and deeds then show the condition of our hearts, and they also affect other people's hearts and can have an effect on other people's hearts. And so then in chapter four, as we're working in word and in deed and in thought and in love, we need to prioritize. We need to prioritize God more and others more, and we need to prioritize self a whole lot less because a selfish heart is really what drives us apart from God. True selflessness lies in humble submission to God, trusting that he is going to raise us up, and then in service to others, trusting that, you know, uh, we are acting on the Lord's behalf, and we're his hands and feet, and, and men will glorify him based on that activity. And then chapter five, what we've, what we've covered today, penitence, patience, and prayer. Trusting in temporal things, things of this earth, is completely futile. That's not what we're getting people to trust in. So we are telling people, as we're living in this broken world, as we're enduring suffering, and as we're trying to make it through this together, wait for the Lord with patience and pray for one another, because that's how we're going to get through this, and forgive one another in faith. We're going to mess up. We're going to rub each other the wrong way. We're going to make mistakes. And so we constantly need to be praying for one another in faith. As Sid used to say, if we're praying for one another, it's very hard to not love someone that you're actively praying for with, with the right kind of heart. So we should always be praying for one another. Okay. That kind of concludes the book of James. There's probably a lot more that we can cover. Any final thoughts or comments on what we talked about today or on the book as a whole? Adam, very good and respectful treatment of this inspired book. I just want to commend you and really appreciate all your labors. I know a tremendous amount of study went into this. Thank you very much, brother. You're welcome. Thank you. And a really good study. I, I tried to uh, get on earlier with one, one of the points where you'd ask for comments and my computer crashed on me right as, it, right as that <laughs> happened, which was probably better for the, uh, probably the best thing anyway. But what really struck me about the study today and really this, this overview that you've got tied up here at, uh, at the end of the class is, is James is telling us to take the long view of things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so often we're, tempted, driven to live in the moment. And, and James is telling us really from the beginning to the end that Christianity is endurance. Christianity is not seeing just what's happening right now, but to recognize what God has promised throughout all eternity, what he's already demonstrated and what he promises that he will be and what he will do for his people. And, and so this idea of patience is a very good way to wrap up this book because that's really what the, the whole message is. Right. Yes. Very good. Adam. Yes. Um, I've been thinking a lot recently about prayer in the Bible and we kind of almost have like a behind the scenes narrative, um, like 
we'll see that Moses prayed and something happened or Hezekiah prayed, Daniel prayed, Hannah prayed. Like we almost have this like behind the scenes narrative of knowing when people pray, but um, we don't necessarily know if God is waiting on like Matt Hudson to pray for something or Amanda to pray for something so that he can fulfill that prayer. Like it might be us needing to, to pray and then he will answer that prayer. I just, it's just been something that I've been thinking about recently. Yeah, uh, certainly, you know, but I think along the line, you know, again, the Lord's ears are always attentive. He is always waiting to hear from us. You know, you, you might ask the question, if, if God knows what we want, why do we need to pray? What's the point? He already knows what's in our mind. He knows what we're thinking and what we want and what we need. So why would we need to pray? Well, you know, I know what my children want, but I still have them ask for it from time to time. Uh, so, you know, I, I think sometimes God is very much the same way. He wants to hear from us because our prayer is not just asking for something all the time or those types of things. It's an expression of a relationship. And so if we're talking to him and relating to him and asking him to relate to us, that's a sign that we want to strengthen that relationship and we're asking him to do that. So, yeah, is he waiting for us to, to speak to him? Yes, absolutely, all the time. Any other comments as we close out? Okay, well, uh, be looking at the, uh, the book of Hebrews for next time. Uh, Eddie will be our teacher next Sunday, same, same time, same channel. Uh, and, you know, as we're looking at our prayer list and looking at, uh, I'm grateful to the Watts for putting that list together and thinking about folks and particularly in kind of enduring the things that we're going through right now and seeing a lot of the turmoil that's happening in our country, both physically and emotionally and spiritually, um, prayer is so, so very important. Um, I, I don't feel adequate to, to tell you that because my prayer life is definitely could always be better. Um, but, but, you know, I think James and, and our, uh, the other writers emphasize that over and over again. So let's be praying for one another uh, and, uh, you know, be looking in the scriptures and encouraging one another uh, as best as we can, even if we have to be apart for a time. Let's, uh, let's appropriate, close in a word of prayer, and then, uh, then we'll end things for today. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we come before you and we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that you have not left us without a witness of yourself. As we look out and we see the changing of the seasons, we see how your world continues as you said it would. And Father, as, as we see the world continuing and know that our time on this earth is very small indeed, we pray that you would help us to keep a larger perspective in mind. We pray that, you know, as, as we're enduring trials or as we're just going through the everyday mundane things that, that may seek to shake our faith or shape our faith, we pray that you would help to drive us to you. Help us to see you in all things and to keep you in the forefront of our minds so that our perspective can be altered to look towards you and to look towards an eternal home with you. And Father, as we do that, help us then to, to, to be examples to other people uh, of how to endure things and to be folks who are not afraid to say, this is how I'm getting through this with the Lord's help, because the Lord was at my side and because you acted on our behalf and we trust that you hear us and you act on our behalf and you know what's good for us. Father, help us to share that confidence with other people so that they too can glorify you and have confidence in you and express their own prayers to you. Father, we pray that you would be with us all. Help us to go through this week. Help us to minister to those folks that, um, that are having a hard time right now, those that are in difficult circumstances. And we've, we've lifted many people to you over the past few weeks. Help us to be your people to one another and to be your church in this world. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been a great study. Thank you for all your participation. Thank you, Adam. See you, bud. Appreciate all your work, Adam.